Away from that, creation of wealth, according to economists, remains the end objective of every business enterprise. Wealth on its own, they say, goes beyond the acquisition of money or some other pecuniary benefits, but uh, includes uh, factors of production and ability to plough back or further investment for the purpose of meeting the fundamental needs of man. However, given the availability or lack of certain factors, the ability to create wealth may likely depend on a number of variables. Joining us now to look closely at this issue is Dr. Olumide Emmanuel, a wealth creation agent and life coach. Good to have you with us, sir. Thanks for having me. So let's start with uh, Africa. Where is it with wealth creation currently and what mm. should, be, uh, should we be doing to achieve this? Uh, well, I think one of the major things we need to begin to do in Africa is to redefine and reposition our educational sector. Um, when we talk about education, um, a lot of people know about being educated and being uneducated, but not many people know about being miseducated. So most of the time, what we call education is actually the miseducation of the masses, because one of the major factors or Characteristics of miseducation is to give people an incomplete education and make them to believe that they have the complete education. Is to omit from people some aspect of education that they actually need to become empowered and self-sufficient and only give them the dimension of education that will keep them dependent in fulfilling the purpose for which you put that education before them in the first place. So one major aspect that is missing in our educational sector is entrepreneurial education. We all know that self-education is very, very key. But when you look at the curriculum of the school system in Africa, self-education is not even part of what is being taught. And then entrepreneurial education is also very key, but we have all been told to go to school, get good grades, and go get a job. So the education is positioned to create job seekers and not job creators. So you find that if someone goes to school, graduates as a BSc, but he still cannot create a job. He needs to go look for a job in order to be able to take care of himself. So the question then will be, what was the purpose of all those education if you still have to go and look for a job? So you should be able to create jobs. So I think that's one major area that we need to look into because right now in Africa, we have over 1.4 billion people. About 70% of them are below the age of 35. So we are a young continent. We are the potential to become the greatest continent on earth. And I believe that that is where we should be looking at. Uh, I, I, my question was going to focus on something else, but when you mentioned, you know, being going to, through the school system just to learn to get a job, basically, I remember taking a course, you know, entrepreneurial development studies, and I'm just wondering, do you think that we do enough in our s school systems to inculcate that entrepreneurial spirit in? You know, we don't do enough. Well, some private schools are beginning to put that because, for instance, in the last um, decade and a half, we've been pushing that, and we have a lot of private schools, private universities, um, organizations that have set up what they call entrepreneurial academies and all stuff to try to you know, bridge the gap. But when we talk about the mainstream educational sector, it's not being done enough, and that needs to come in from the elementary level. Mm -hmm. And once we begin to catch them young, and begin to introduce it to them in modules, people will grow up recognizing that, look, I don't have to go only in this route. For instance, a lot of people don't want to go to technical schools. Mm. People just want to go professional mm. education, but there's so much that needs to be done in that aspect of technical education. Yeah. But people think it's an inferior kind of education just because of this miseducation issue. Very good. Look that's, at ICT right yeah, now. That's, you know, so yeah. that's exactly where I'm going now. We're seeing a youthful participation in IT and, of course, uh, fintech sectors of the economy despite uh, logistics uh, shortcomings. So can we leverage this as uh, on wealth creation, especially entrepreneurship that you just uh, Yeah, ICT as well? is very key. For instance, one of the things I believe we should be looking at is to go into what I call the learn to earn kind of education. Where, because see, what's the purpose of education? Education does four things. It teaches you how to read how to write, how to calculate, do arithmetic or mathematics, and how to think analytically. But because those who set up the educational sector had a purpose in mind, they want to create people that will help them to build capital and help them to create wealth. So because the agenda was never to empower you, that was why they had to omit what will help you to go on your own. But now, everyone is talented. So question, you are a singer. 
Why should a singer go to university to study biochemistry or study engineering when he could have gone to music school and study everything that is to understand about music and the business of music? Why should an actor have to go to school and study something else? And we reduce all these major aspects of our life to what we call, oh, is his talent. You are supposed to go to school to <laughs> develop your talent, to develop your skill. That is supposed to be the purpose of education because you are supposed to discover what you have and develop it and then deploy it for wealth creation. That development, that's where education comes in. Education is supposed to be for the development of the giftings and the talent that you already have, which is innate in everybody. There is no talentless individual. But you see people, they will go to school, study biochemistry, study engineering, become an accountant. Then later they say, no, I'm not feeling fulfilled. And I decided to pursue my passion. <laughs> and then they become billionaires and millionaires. Mm. That passion is what you should have done in the first place. You didn't need to go through that other route. But because the miseducation is massive, I'm telling you, it's massive, that people cannot even think outside of that. And when you see someone that did not go through that fall of a school, we call him an illiterate. You see someone, let's say for instance in Nigeria now, you have people from the East, they have what they call the apprentice system, mm -hmm. which has become a global template that even Harvard is studying the Igbo apprentice <laughs> system. Whereas when someone did not go to school mm -hmm. and he serves under the Igbo apprentice system and he goes for five to seven years under his master and he's settled, you call him an illiterate. He didn't go to say he's an illiterate, but the illiterate will start a business and employ you, the chartered accountant, to be his accountant. The illiterate will start a business, become a billionaire, and employ you, a chartered accountant, to come and manage his account. You cannot even charter Uber or charter a plane. So you need to, we need to understand that that is something we need to begin to look at to help people in Africa. That's why when you look at the Western world today, because we are, we are entering into what I call the recolonization of the continent. If you look at many nations today, you find out that a lot of their children don't want to go to school anymore. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they have realized that, look, I can be a sports person, yeah. I can make money, I can be a musician, I can be a comedian, but everybody cannot be a musician, everybody cannot be a comedian. So where will the pilots of tomorrow come from? Where will the surgeons of tomorrow come from? So we are not saying that that academic education is not required, mm -hmm. but we are saying that we need to redefine it and have holistic education that I call the seven-star education, which is complete and holistic, so that people can have options. So that when I want to become the best version of myself, I'm not limited to having to go through a university system. Yeah. Because in the world we live in today, the world is fast changing. By the time you resume into the university, the world you were in when you resume will no more exist when you graduate. By the time you graduate, you are graduating into a different world. And over 80% of what you learn in the university is useless in the real world. So why not strip off all the things that doesn't work and give people the exact education that will help them to develop their skill and then come into the market and become job creators. Because all over the world, the job of the government is not to prosper you. The job of the government is not to give you a job. Their job is to create an enabling environment, put infrastructures in place, and put policies in place for you to start something and become an employer of labor. All over the world, it is small businesses that grow the economy. And that's what Africa should begin to look at. Key point, enabling environment. I want to bring this back home to Nigeria. Yeah. Do we have an enabling environment considering what we, the Nigeria of today? Okay. The, I'm talking as we strike, I'm talking insecurity, I'm talking the economy. Is this an enabling environment for wealth creators as things are right now? Now, at the risk of sounding like a motivational speaker, tough times never last, <laughs> tough people do. An enabling environment is a function of your perception. Sure. Why? Because what you see is perception. How you see it is perspective. Now, everything you call problem actually an opportunity. Crisis creates opportunities. One of the things we need to understand is that everything we are calling deficiency problem, that's an opportunity to create wealth. That's an opportunity to offer value. So yes, the environment is not enabling enough. But if you wait for favorable conditions, you won't get anything done. So while you are where we, you are, like we say, at the risk of sounding like a motivational speaker, mm -hmm. if you cannot fly, run. If you cannot run, walk. If you cannot walk, crawl. Oh. No matter what, just make sure you are moving on. Because you know, I run what we call the Billionaires Conclave. I, I mentor a group of billionaires. Yesterday we had a meeting. Mm. I was talking to them about leading in tough times. Mm. Because the timings are tough. America yeah. has technically entered into a recession. You, um, Europe, the United Kingdom, there is heat. There is um, inflation. Mm -hmm. Ukraine war is there. Food scarcity. Okay, so, so as a leader, how do you lead in tough times? And I was helping them to understand that regardless of how tough the times are, 
There are companies and organizations that have gone through all kinds of thought and they have remained sustainable because they know what to do. And one of the things you need to do is to go into what I call big picture thinking. Look mm. at things differently. If you are walking, if, if for instance, like if you are driving, every building around you looks big, but mm -hmm. if you are flying, the building looks like a pebble. Indeed. So instead of you staying in the midst of that crowd and being swamped by what everybody is saying, now the sound bites of social media, things are bad, things are bad, things are bad, why not go to a higher level of thinking and look at things with what we call aerial view? Because we keep selling the wrong narratives, and these wrong narratives keep programming us as a software that keeps us down. One of the major negative narratives that is keeping us down in Nigeria is that Nigeria is broke. It's a lie. <laughs> Nigeria is not broke. This country is full of money. There is opportunity everywhere. It is being stolen. Nigeria is not broke. The money is there. Every day, every week, every month, income is coming from different parastatal, but the income is being stolen. The income is being diverted. So you can't say a country is broke because somebody is stealing the money. You can only say a country is broke if they are not generating enough income to meet the needs that needs to be met. Indeed, it's all about uh, thinking outside of the box, as it were. Now, if we may look at this from another dimension, there's a belief that African cities are being built for wealth, consumption, not creation. What do you make of this uh, scenario? Well, it's sad but true. For instance, when I hear things like third world nation, and I used to think, ah, third world, ah, did God create three different worlds? Until I began to study to realize that when a nation is rated by its ability to produce or consume, so why we say nation, most African nations are third world nations. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they are consumer nations. When you go into a lot of African nations, you find out that we are not even proud of what we produce. We have created a, you know, a status symbol virus that makes us think that everything foreign is good. So most African countries don't produce anything. And instead of producing and processing, which is where the real money is, we have the largest natural resource in many of the African countries. But the Westerners have realized that these guys are not good at producing what they have. They are not good at processing, so they come take your raw material, and then they go process, and they return to you, and then you buy. How can a nation like Nigeria not have one refinery? Mm. So, I mean, sometimes I see that, they say, you know, that mm. refinery will soup. I say, are these guys all right? You Why are put like, your eggs in one, one basket? One human being went to start refinery, all of you, the whole <laughs> country, all the politicians in 1999, you couldn't revive the one that is existing. One man is building his own, and you are sitting and waiting for him. Are you guys okay? That is the narrative because people are not ready to do what needs to be done. So yes, unfortunately, most African countries are consumer nations. Look at what has happened to the dollar now. People have been asking, what's that? I said, there is no way it won't be like that. You are not producing anything. The only thing you are producing and selling is the crude oil. Hmm. When the dollar of the crude oil comes, you have to use it to pay for the processing of the crude oil. So you don't really have anything. And then you have to borrow money. And the money you borrow half of it is stolen. There's nothing wrong in borrowing if you are borrowing for infrastructure development. Mm -hmm. But when you borrow and there's over invoicing and there's inflation, you are just fooling yourself. Right now, just about one a week or two ago, now our debt servicing has gone beyond our income. How can you do uh, that? Uh, so most African countries are actually consumer nations. And um, it's unfortunate, but we can change that narrative by beginning to focus on Africa for Africans. Mm -hmm. If you look at nations that have developed, China, Singapore, one of the things they did was to close their economy to everybody else in order to focus on themselves. And when they opened it up, they were exports. So we need to begin to think of all the different things we can do to export so that we can begin to earn. So African nations can become great if they begin to focus on production. Tell us more about the Africa for Africa bit because we have about one minute and 30 seconds. Africa for Africa, let's start from everybody by Africa. Mm. That's all. If all of us, if we decide, if one policy, if the governor or the president comes today and say nobody in Nigeria or Africa must buy anything that is outside of Africa, all our cars, African cars, all our clothes, just say everybody wear native clothes, all banks, all schools, all lecturers, all civil servants, before you know it, mm. the fashion industry will do pew. Do you know there was a time in this country where they don't play Nigerian music on radio, on TV? You have to beg. I remember those times in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was, they would have to go and be begging for them to play Nigerian music. Today now, Nigerian music is everywhere. These guys in, in, in the music industry, movie industry, comedy, by the sheer doggedness of individuals, they have built an industry that we are now trying to lay claim that is our industry. But people built it. And that shows you the potential that is there if the government of Africa can back sports, music, entertainment in general, technology, and then farming. 
Afrocentric. Mm. In that uh, vein, Dr. Lumide Emmanuel, wealth agent, uh, life coach, it's uh, been an honor to have you on the show. Thanks today. for having me. Thank you.